Hello, thank you for invitation here. Uh, I hope I can show you some interesting stuff about uh, Vilamovica and about the language and message. Uh, if you have some question, then uh, let's ask me. I, I, I will be glad to answer you. So, uh, Vilamovica is a small town uh, in uh, southern Poland. Uh, I have some problems with the presentation. I cannot put the next slide. Maybe hope it will work. So it is in the southern Poland, and it was established by uh, settlers. Uh, there were people from Western Europe, probably from uh, today from West Germany or West uh, or uh, Netherlands, uh, and they have established a small uh, village, Vilamovica. Yeah, but I, as I said, I have some problems with the presentation. Maybe you can. Maybe you can help me. So maybe I will try to speak without the presentation if it doesn't work. But it had to work for 10 minutes. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, the language was Germanic and it was very different from the uh, language of surrounding villages because uh, the people in surrounding villages have spoken in mostly in Slavic languages. It, it was Polish or Silesian. Uh, in a town, uh, uh, in a town uh, next to Vilamovice in Bielsko Biała, uh, there was there were some uh, German settlers, uh, and they have spoken German. So the dialects were very various as well, uh, but um, their ad identity was typically German. And it was like uh, Vilamovians in Vilamovice have said we are Vilamovians, we are something special. Uh, the people in the villages surrounding uh, are Poles or the Silesians, so Slavic, uh, so Slavic people. Uh, they spoke in Slavic languages. And in Bielsko and in Biała, in these two big towns uh, uh, in the south, uh, there are Germans. And uh, uh, it was very, um, yeah, and Vilamovice belonged first in the 13th century. It was, uh, uh, it was, um, uh, it, it belongs to Czech uh, kingdom. And then, uh, yeah, we tried to do something with the presentation, but. Well, maybe I will try to connect one time more. Yeah, so um, that was very special. And in Vilamovice, there was a, a quite big uh, Jewish minority as well. Uh, so um, it was a region that there were many languages. And uh, in Vilamovice, there was a diglossia or triglossia because 
people spoke in Bemeseri. It was a language that uh, used to be spoken at home uh, with their families. Uh, in a particular time in the school, it was used in the church. Uh, uh, it was used uh, in everyday life and in the ad in the town hall and uh, uh, sometimes in the church as well, uh, was uh, German was used or Polish, because then Wilamowice uh, belonged to Polish kingdom, then to Austrian Empire, Austrian-Hungarian Empire, and then um, in, it was in 1772, uh, and in 1918 uh, it came back to uh, Poland. And Vidamovians uh, are different from uh, the people from surrounding villages. It was not only because of the language, it was not, not only because, the, because of the folk dress, it was as well because of, the, uh, of uh, their work. Uh, the people in, on, in Polish villages uh, were farmers, and it was the only thing that they have done. And uh, Vilamovians were different because uh, they were firstly weavers and they have sold their uh, stuff in all over Europe. Uh, they sold it in Vienna, in Berlin, in London, in Madrid, in Paris, in Moscow, uh, in St. Petersburg, in, in, in many, in many uh, cities. And uh, yeah, and they were traders. So the traders were seen as something not good, somebody who is not, uh, yeah, who has to lie because uh, he has to buy something cheap and sell it uh, expensive uh, for a bigger price. So, uh, so they, uh, so they started to. Uh, they started to uh, be traders, and they started to be separated from separate from the uh, from the uh, other communities surrounding. I will try maybe do something with the presentation because I think it's very important that you see some things on the sides, and I cannot do anything with it. Uh, Slide do you need? Uh, yeah, I think now the third slide, but on my uh, screen I can all the time see the first slide. Um, I could okay. try to connect one time more and maybe it would. Uh, it would... Try to refresh your web page. We will wait for you, okay? Everything. Yeah. Does it work? I think so. Uh, yeah. Now it it works. <laughs> so okay, here great. you see the here you see in this red point on the map of Polish country uh, there is the place where Pilamowice is. So this is uh, the border of uh, Silesia and Lesser Poland. There are two big regions. Silesia used to belong to Germany very long time, and it was on Germanic uh, influence. And on the left side, you see a, a map of uh, the surrounding villages of Vilamowice. Vilamowice is in the uh, uh, in the uh, northeast, and uh, the Bielsko-Biała region, where it was, uh, where the Germanic dialects used to be uh, uh, spoken, is uh, this dark uh, this dark uh, thing. 
so the Amorites were surrounded by Slavic uh, speaking people, and but in, uh, very near to the Amorites, there was a, a town that used to speak uh, in other languages, in, in uh, Germanic dialect. Uh, so, um, the Amorians uh, said that they are, uh, that they are Vilamovians, as I said, something special, but they used, uh, they felt the bound with the Austrian Empire. They said that the, um, the Emperor, the Franz Josef II, uh, that he was the Emperor, and it was very important for them that they were a part of it. Vienna was a uh, uh, was a symbol of uh, power of the best town what you can uh, build. So Vilamovic, when uh, they were building the market square in Vilamovic, so the cathedral or everything, they uh, they tried to make it similar to uh, to that in Vienna. Uh, and uh, as I said, because of weaving, because of the uh, trader, uh, because of this, that they were traders. Uh, they were uh, much richer than people from surrounding villages, so they could, in eight, 1808, they could uh, buy Vilamovice from the uh, uh, from the uh, local lord, and uh, they can they have established a town. So it wasn't a village anymore; it was a town in uh, 1818, and. Uh, Thanks to it, Vilamovice started to develop, and uh, it was very important for uh, language ideologists. So uh, the Vilam Vilamovians were seen as somebody who is uh, rich, somebody who is successful. So their language and their culture were, uh, was as well something what was um, very good, something what was uh, very special and in positive way. So uh, if somebody married a Vilamovian woman or a Vilamovian man, uh, these people have learned the message, and they have, uh, they started to be, uh, they wanted to uh, assimilate with the Vilamovian culture. Uh, there were many Vilamovians who were, were in other towns, as I said, so in other cities. Uh, there was a big uh, community, Vilamovian community in Vienna, as well it was a big community in other, uh, other cities, for example in Trieste. Uh, now it's Italy, but it used to be in Austrian Empire as Vilamovic as well. And there was a guy whose, whose name was Florian Biesik. He was born in Vilamovic in 18, uh, 1815, 50, and he uh, started to write Vilamovian poems in, as he lived in Trieste. It, it was in the end of 19th century, in the beginning of 20th century. and. Um, Maybe you have heard about Dante Alighieri. It was a uh, it was an Italian poet from 13th century, I think, and he wanted to establish uh, Italian literature and to be the father of uh, Italian language. So uh, Florian Biesik uh, was uh, he could speak fluent Vilamovian as well, but he could speak fluent Italian. So uh, for him, uh, he was a symbol of the. Like he wanted to become a father of the Amorian language, a father of uh, a father of uh, the Amorian, uh, literature. So he has written a, uh, he has written a poem. It was a very large, very long poem uh, about. It was based on the Divine Comedy from Dante Alighieri, and it uh, it is something like uh, his journey through. Uh, heaven and hell, uh, and there he uh, sees uh, many Vilamovians and he speaks with them, and it's a very interesting um, text, and he has written many other texts uh, in the message as well, uh, and he has written a little bit about Vilamovian mythology, so he has written that Vilamovians come, uh, that the god had um, uh, yeah, he had uh, created the world uh, in Vilamovian, and he made some uh, uh, yeah, pseudo-scientific uh, uh, explanation about it, that in Vilamovians the words Adam and Eva means uh, uh, the man of the earth and the, and the life, so it's, uh, so yeah, it was very, but it was, we know that it's not, uh, I think even uh, most of Vilamovians didn't believe it, but 
but it's very interesting uh, history that the way how he had seen the message language and he wanted to show that it's uh, one of the most important language uh, languages it's not less important than any other uh, language and uh, it's imp very interesting that he had a very big uh, uh, conflict with his brother because his brother thought that is uh, thought and he has written in his text that Vermeserisch is a dialect of German so uh, the Florian didn't like uh, it and didn't like his brother because of it and in this poem uh, he puts his brother to the hell and he shows that because of this uh, he should be in, in the hell. So uh, before the Second World War in Vilambian there was come on the DR3 Glossia Vermeserisch in, uh, in other words for it in English is Vilambian, Polish and German uh, school and church was in Polish or, uh, or in Austria, but many, uh, but if uh, many teachers could speak Vermeserisch, so they taught in Vermeserisch as well. Uh, and in the administration, official languages were German and Polish, but uh, people, uh, there were people who spoke uh, Vermeserisch as well. Um, you know, this um, uh, this region was on the border of uh, Poland and Germany. So it was always the place of conflicts. It was a place of the conflict, but I think it wasn't like uh, the conflicts of people who lived there. It was more like uh, the conflict of, in of big, uh, big nations who want to influence this uh, region. So uh, the German um, activists, the German scientists, linguists mostly, and ethnographers wanted to prove that this region was always German and that Vilamovians are Germans. So they have written many texts about uh, some Germanic uh, relics of, in Vilamovian culture and Vilamovian language. And the Polish people tried to convince Vilamovians that they should feel Polish, they should feel of uh, the part of Polish nation. But I think um, both of them uh, weren't uh, successful, that Vilamovians were thinking all the time, we are Vilamovians, there are Germans, there are Poles, but we are Vilamovians. In, uh, as German occupation came in 1939, uh, Vilamovians were forced to um, sign the Volksliste. So the Volksliste was a document that uh, told about your German uh, German um, nationality and uh, national citizenship, yeah. And uh, Vilamovians were seen as Germans. So if they said we aren't Germans uh, and they said that we, they will not uh, sign this document, they were sent to concentration camps. So most of them have signed this Volksliste and um, they became German citizens. Uh, citizens of the Third uh, Reich. Yeah? But uh, the people from the surrounding villages uh, were seen as Poles, uh, so they could be set, uh, they could be expelled from the houses, uh, and Vilamovians could take uh, uh, could uh, take their houses. But uh, the Vilamovians have said uh, on the there was a big meeting of German occupation uh, gover local government and Vilamovians and Vilamovians said they don't want to take somebody's houses they they want to remain in their houses in Vilamovica and um, the people from the surrounding villages uh, because of um, they were Poles so they were seen as some somebody uh, less worth yeah, in uh, view of the German occupation. So um, they were used to work and uh, it was, uh, they could be sent to Germany to work or they could be, uh, they could register in Vilamovian houses, in Vilamovian farms. And then uh, if they were registered there, they didn't need to go to, uh, yet to the West. And many of them have registered, and it was a fictional work because uh, it was only, a, you know, they said uh, we will register here, but we will not work. Uh, we only want to remain here. And Vilamovians have helped them. And um, after, but unfortunately, after the Second World War, uh, as the Soviet army uh, came to Vilamovice, um, um, it was um, a very hard time because. Uh, you know, it was a poor uh, region uh, in that time, and the uh, and the uh, Soviet uh, army uh, had looked for Germans. Yeah, that they uh, 
that they wanted to uh, uh, yeah, to, to take Germans to some uh, rubble camps in uh, the Soviet Union. But uh, the Polish people from surrounding villages have told that Vilamovians are Germans, so, and that Vilamovian language is a German language. So it, in the hard time after the Second World War, it was prohibited to speak Vilamovian, it was prohibited to uh, speak, uh, speak Vilamovian to wear the clothes, but it was not the... Um, you know, it wasn't the uh, the decret of this ban. It wasn't from the central government of Poland, from the communist government. It wasn't from the Soviet uh, Soviet army. It was from the Polish uh, farmers from surrounding villages. Yeah. So uh, the central government of Poland in that time, the communist government, wasn't interested in. Vilamovians, because it was a very small uh, group, and uh, uh, and uh, after the uh, Second World War, uh, many of Vilamovians were uh, exposed from their houses to uh, to another uh, houses, uh, to, not to another house, exposed from their houses, and they have had to leave. Uh, and it was very hard for the language uh, because, um, yeah, the, it was the ban and the children could not speak uh, the research. And it was very hard for them because uh, for the uh, elder people, yeah, for the adults, it was not, yeah, it was very hard, but it was more like, yeah, there is the ban of our language so we can speak in Polish because they could speak Polish. But uh, there was a problem uh, for the children because uh, the children uh, could not speak Polish, so uh, the older people had to uh, take them to some shelters. They had to hide. Th they had to hide them that nobody hears them speaking uh, speaking the message. And uh, yeah, so uh, it was the hardest time for Vilamovians. It was the after. Uh, Second World War time, and in during the Second World War, it was very hard too because um, the German occupation government said that uh, here is the uh, pure Germanic uh, uh, region, so you cannot speak Polish. And Vilamovians who used to speak Polish as well because they have spoken in many languages, they couldn't speak Polish anymore because it was forbidden. So I think I have. A problem with the presentation the second time, so maybe I would try to refresh one time more. Okay. I hope that it will it will work. So you see, uh, the Vietnam uh, wear the Vietnamese clothes, and they have spoken on the message, and they looked like they looked like here. This is a wedding from 1913, and yeah, 40 years later, uh, they uh, had to wear uh, uh, clothes like any other people, and they have to speak. Uh, the message, and uh, it was the year of two thousand. Of two thousand, nobody spoke the message. Uh, some other people uh, have remembered this language, but they didn't want to use it, or they there was no ban anymore. But it was more like uh, they thought, why should we speak it? We have suffered so much because of it. So maybe it would be better if we forget about our language. And a professor of uh, linguistic or social linguistic from Poland, uh, Professor Tomasz Wiharkiewicz. Uh, he has written, because he had uh, uh, made some research about the Mesereci language, and he has written uh, an um, article about the Mesereci, and he has uh, written there that uh, the uh, death of uh, the Mesereci uh, language will be in the next 10 years. So it was in the year 2000. So, um, uh, he thought that in the year 2010 it will be the end of the message language. I was in that time, I was seven years old, 
So I thought, uh, for me, it was very hard uh, because I thought I don't want that my language disappear. <laughs> and it was like my grandma uh, had uh, uh, spoken with me the Mysterious, but I think I was the only one child who spoke the Mysterious fluent in that time. But uh, she hadn't done it because she wanted to uh, teach me this language. It was more like she was speaking with her uh, neighbor and her neighbor uh, was very, uh, because of this afterwards persecution, she was very, uh, she didn't like to speak Polish, so she spoke always in Missouri. And, but I, I, did, I, really, I did like, I did enjoy speaking in Missouri, so I wanted to do something not to, that our language will not disappear. And in that time, there were about 100 living Vinamogan speakers. So it was in the year 2003, as I started to uh, make some, uh, this is my first uh, revitalization. There was no possibility to learn the mysteries at school, and there was no local interest in saving the languages, in saving the language. And I started to uh, write some text in school newspaper. I established a circle of Vinamovian culture. So for the children from the school, there were about 10 children we met. It wasn't allowed to meet in the school because it was not so good to make something with the Missouri language. So we met uh, in local parish or we met at home. And I started to record the speech and um, information about Vinamovian culture uh, in the Missouri language. And uh, I uh, have recorded about 18, about 18 native speakers which, uh, who were born between 1913 and 1956. Uh, they were mostly friends of my grandma, but uh, soon it happened that I have met all uh, living native speakers of the Missouri in that time. And I have uh, uh, made uh, yeah, about 800 hours of uh, recorded uh, speech in 12 years. Uh, there, are, there are very different topics because uh, first I started to record songs and nicknames and anecdotes because I was yeah, I, I was still a child or a teenager so I didn't have linguistic uh, background uh, but uh, soon I started to record uh, grammar rules some things to dic dictionary uh, some histories about customs mythology folk tales memories histories biograms genealogies and descriptions of costume. And uh, many times it was like the people wanted to speak Polish because it was better for them because they haven't spoken the message uh, for uh, 60 years or something like this. But then I had to do something to um, that, that they should speak the message. So I have taken, for example, some parts of the message folk costume that there are no names in Polish of uh, it. So uh, the people, the people had to speak the message because there are not no Polish words for it, and they started to speak, and then about other topics, uh, they spoke in research as well. Uh, but uh, native speakers, uh, unfortunately, the native speakers are very old, and they die, uh, they pass uh, away uh, every year. So now we have about uh, 20 uh, native speakers, fluent native speakers in the research who are mostly over 85 years old. So this is my grandma. She she's that that she died three years ago, but I have made many recordings with her, and thanks to her, I have met many other people. But when I was young, when I was teen, I thought it's very bad that there are not no some not so many information about the message in the internet. So I have written to the Library of USA Congress uh, that. Uh, they don't have on the uh, register, they don't have the Vimeseri language, and they have uh, registered it, they have given it this in CIL, and the Ethnologue had uh, recognized the Vimeseri and the UNESCO in 2009. Uh, there was, uh, there were some, some Vimeseri tried to teach Vimeseri in the school. There was a Vimeseri uh, poet, Yusuf Gara, he has written uh, Dictionary of the Messiary language. He has written, uh, has published uh, uh, some poems in the Messiary, and he uh, taught it in the school. But it was only uh, he was trying, but nobody wanted to help him, and he wasn't a teacher. He was a, a coal miner, so he didn't have any a, uh, any background for teaching. But uh, he wanted to teach, and we wanted to learn it. So we uh, visited his uh, classes. 
but uh, many people in Vidamovice uh, weren't uh, they didn't think that it was a good uh, idea to revitalize the necessary. For example, the director of local center of culture uh, said in an interview for a news very uh, common newspaper newspaper in Poland that uh, the Vidamovian language doesn't play a decisive part. It is absolutely deprived of sense and it has served to describe times which are gone and it is disappearing in a natural way. So this is a um, example of ne very negative uh, ideologies, uh, language ideologies that uh, yeah, that say that you, you shouldn't learn the message. And it's even from the uh, Vidamovian uh, guy. Yeah? The Catholic parish in Vidamovice it is a very important place because most of Vidamovians are Catholics. And the you know in Poland it's like if the priest says something, it's very important for the community mostly. So um, if they were uh, the priests in in Vidamovice weren't against the language, but um, it wasn't a big support. But there was a very important. There is a very important community movement. So the regional dance group. Uh, uh, of uh, Vidamovice, and uh, the dance group started to dance after the Second World War, Vidamovian dances, but in other clothes, not in Vidamovian folk dress because it was forbidden, but then they started to use more and more Vidamovian elements and started to use more Vidamovian uh, songs. Uh, and as you see, now the group is very big, there are about 70 members, and they are in uh, various ages, uh, so the youngest uh, uh, children are five years old, and the oldest people are 90 years old, and they dance uh, together, and it's very important, this inter intergenerational, uh, intergeneration, uh, that the language is uh, taught uh, from one generation to, uh, to uh, another. And there are some Vidamovian texts, and there is knowledge about the names in Vidamovian of the uh, Vidamovian uh, folk dress. And uh, they make some uh, reconstruction of Vidamovian traditions. There are scripts in Vidamovian and the songs, so the language is uh, present in the, in the community. And there is an association of, for the preservation of cultural heritage of Vidamovice as well, and um, there are some. Uh, important, uh, there are some uh, important activities, for example, publications, support for the uh, uh, group, uh, guiding uh, journalists or other people in Vilamovice, uh, presentation in institutions of culture in all over Poland and, and abroad. But uh, for example, the presentations, uh, it's not, uh, it's important, but not because only because of the presenting uh, the language to another people. For example, in this uh, picture, you see the three old women speaking the message, and the woman in the middle, uh, she didn't want to uh, come with us because she sa said, I don't want to speak the message because it was forbidden, I wouldn't want to come back to these times. But then she decided to come, and then he, she has spoken on, on the stage uh, on some cultural, in a cultural center in a big town in Poland. And after that time, she said to me, you know, this is, uh, I thank you that you have organized it, that you have invited me, because now I see I can speak the message and I will speak. And now she helps us in the revitalization. So it's very important, not, not only for the people from other parts of the world, it's very important, even if you, we make a presentation for another people, it's important for our people as well. So the changing of local language ideologies, for example, giving some uh, uh, papers, some uh, uh, thanks, uh, to thank some people who work with us, who have suffered something after the Second World War. It's very important to show them on the stage that they are, that they work with us, and that we are we are not only a couple of uh, activists, we are a big community. Yeah? Uh, and uh, there are, from this association, Vilamovianie, we have organized some exhibitions about Vilamovian culture, even from the old culture, old material culture, as well about the nowadays times and uh, the descriptions of artifacts or films are always in the message, and sometimes it's in Polish as well, sometimes it's in English as well, that the people can see that it's not. Uh, 
uh, that Vimeserish is not a part of Polish language, that it's, you know, Vimeserish can exist without Polish, can exist with English descriptions as well, or can exist all, only in Vimeserish descriptions. And uh, the speeches in the Serish language of the other members are very important as well. Uh, in the language uh, landscape of the Serish, there are some uh, there are some boards in the Serish, as you see. Uh, this is a board that you, when you come to Vilamovice, this is the first what you see. Skakumt It's it means uh, welcome in Vilamovice. Very important in the um, revitalization is the documentation. It's not only because um, you can do some activists for people, you can do some presentation for another people, you, but you cannot teach the language if it's not good documented. So it's very important that uh, people, uh, that there is this uh, intergenerational influence that the old people teach the younger people. But very important is as well that your language is documented, that you have uh, developed the orthography. What we have done uh, on the beginning of our uh, work, it was about the year of 2010. But the dictionary is a very big thing. It is very, it's uh, very huge that we have to uh, we have to work on it many years, I think. But you see, this is the this is a part of our. Work. So in the language landscaping, there are many boards that people uh, do for their shops or on the cemetery, on the graves uh, that it was forbidden, but now it comes uh, back. And uh, you cannot forget if you make a revitalization of a language, you cannot forget about other um, parts of the culture, about our about other things, because as well the folk dress and the uh, traditions, it's, it is everything bound together. It's one big. Uh, issue and uh, you cannot divide it to a language and, and other things and uh, mostly uh, it helps because I thought maybe we should focus on the language and the other for the other things we don't have time but then I have seen that it's very important because if you work on another things you can meet another people and it uh, and this everything uh, is uh, more uh, simple yeah? the revitalization is not a simple process but if you uh, Make it in from many sides. It's uh, it's more simple. For example, we made this uh, reconstructions of some Vyamogan clothes uh, for dress, and the people who uh, part in it decided to start to learn the mystery. So it, it was very uh, important. And uh, the clothes are very uh, various. They are very different from Polish clothes, and uh, there are many different names in the mystery of this. So it's very important for the uh, revitalization too. And in the year 2011, because it was mostly we were using our uh, own powers, we, we didn't have any uh, any support from uh, from outside. Uh, but in uh, 2011, 2012, a project uh, from uh, from the University of Warsaw has started. So it was Endangered Languages, uh, Comprehensive Models for Research and Revitalization. And uh, it was, uh, it lasted to 2016. And uh, it was a very interesting project. It was cooperation between uh, three communities. Uh, so the, uh, um, it was the Ruthenian language in Poland, uh, the Meserich language in Poland and the Nawa language in Mexico and the three communities uh, we have cooperated together on one model of language revitalization. We're thinking how does it look like, what problems we have to deal in Vilamovice, what problems we have to deal in uh, Ruthenian language and what problems we have to deal uh, in Mexico. And um, we have visited Mexico, they have visited us. So it was very uh, important, very interesting that we could uh, exchange our uh, our information, and that we uh, we have um, prepared as well a website, uh, the website uh, in uh, about these three communities, but it's in Spanish, English, Venezuelan, Ruthenian, 
in Nawa and in Polish. So uh, in every language that you can, and, and in our minority languages as well. And it's very important that uh, there is not only the staff about the language, not only the staff um, that the, lang uh, the staff in the language, the material in the language is not only the folk tales or something like this, that something like download or search or cookies or everything that it's in, in your language. It's very important because it shows that your language uh, can be used to everything, yeah? not only to uh, describe old times. Uh, many, because of our presence in the internet, our in media, uh, some people from abroad uh, started to be interested in Dilamovice, for example, a guy from uh, from uh, Australia, a commission, uh, decided to come to Dilamovice to learn the Swedish language and then to write books for children. And he has done it, and it was very, uh, for, we are very happy because of it, because a young guy came to Dilamovice, he studied our language a couple of months, and uh, uh, we really like him, and uh, he comes uh, every year or every two years. He comes to Vilamovice and he makes something more with us, so we like it. And we have many uh, people interested in Vilamovice from many countries as well, from Russia. So maybe if you are interested in Vilamovice as well in our language, and you can contact me, and we can organize something together. And um, in the in last time, from the uh, thanks to the support of the University of Warsaw, we have published some books for children uh, in the Muslim language. We have organized uh, uh, some conferences. For example, in 2014, it was a very big conference, international conference about uh, endangered languages. In Vilamovice, it was very important as well, because many uh, Professors, many scientists, scholars from all the world have se have seen what Vilamovica is. Uh, but secondly, many people in Vilamovica have seen that it's very important our language because of our language. And many people, uh, many people came to Vilamovica. So, so uh, as you see, there were uh, the elder people. There was the local government, and there was uh, there were the people from all over the world in, uh, in Vilamovica. Uh, then we started to um, try to get recognized by Polish government because Polish government, there is a document that says about minority and regional languages in Poland that uh, should be supported by the government. And there are um, 13 languages. Um, there are mostly languages of, uh, uh, for example, there's a, a German minority in Poland, the, uh, Belarusian minority in Poland, Ukrainian minority in Poland. So there are mostly languages of minorities, and there is the Kashubian language, which is recognized as a regional language in Poland. And then if, if a language is recognized as a regional or minority language, uh, then you, uh, you can uh, teach, you can learn it in the school. Not uh, So there's only three hours per week, but there is some financial support for it. Or if you want to publish a book in this language, there is some support for it. But Vemeserich is not recognized as, re as regional language. We try to do it, but it's very hard. So we have visited the Polish parliament uh, in a, on a conference, but uh, unfortunately we are not successful. And maybe one time it will, we try, we go there every year and we show us, but uh, it's very hard uh, if, uh, you know, if the, your language is too big, there are too big, too many speakers or too few speakers is not it's not so uh, simple so if we cannot teach it in the school uh, by the uh, week and we teach it but it's not so official but i think it's uh, you know to teach in the school is important for the status of your language that you can show that the language can be taught in the school that it's not a worse language than another than a dominant language but uh, as I have seen that, uh, as I have, um, I have been teaching the Swedish language since 2011, so it's seven years already, and I uh, see that uh, the most, uh, the best way of teach the language is in uh, uh, if you teach it not so official. So if you teach it in, in at home, it's like more like a speech. It's more like a family, like community, like friends. It's not the school because. You know, many people who go to school, the children, it, the school is obligatory, so they have to teach, but then they want to have some free time. 
And if you try to, for example, we make it in this way that the message is cool for them. It's not like it's obligatory. So I think uh, on one hand side that we are not recognized as a language, it could be harder. But on the other side, it's like thanks to it, women's search is not seen as a subject in the school. It's something cool that people who want to do it, they come. And I think it's, I like it. Yeah. And the cooperation with the older people is very important as well. So, for example, if I uh, give uh, my, my students uh, some homeworks, many times they have to do it with their grandpas, grandmas or neighbors. So it's very important. And um, what was very important for local uh, language ideologies? I think, I don't know how is it in your uh, place, but, uh, but for example, in Poland, the, um, uh, the word uh, language ideology is not so common, but in the Western uh, social linguistic is very uh, important. So the language ideology is uh, this is uh, this what you think about the language. So what you think that you should use it or not, or uh, is it better or worse, or is it the language of old people or young people or poor people or rich people or something like this. But many times uh, there are many very negative uh, ideologies. For example, in Gramovice it was like you cannot do um, a theatrical play in the Messerich because nobody will understand it or something like this. So uh, we made, uh, we, we have organized a play, The Little Prince, because uh, we knew that The Little Prince is very, uh, it's a very common book in Poland. Uh, so uh, in in Europe, and uh, we have uh, spoke. We have organized a theatrical play in the Messerich, and uh, first the people said, "You know, we we cannot, we will not understand." But then, as because they knew it in Polish, so they have understood this uh, play, and they have uh, made. Uh, they have made. Uh, uh, they they did enjoy the play, and they said, "Yeah, it was." It is something very good. And um, uh, the next play uh, was The Hobbit. So it was, it is a very important uh, thing. Uh, it is a very important um, book in uh, in Poland. Uh, many, and it was this, this film, so it's very popular in the uh, uh, young generation. Uh, so uh, they, uh, uh, have the young people have organized it. It was very important that it's not something that the teachers say we have to do this, but it was more like we as teachers, we have spoken with the, the teenagers and we have asked what would you like to present and they said they would like to present the Hobbit and uh, for example, you see this dragon on the stage. It was made by ourselves. So the people have used some, I don't know, toilet paper and some uh, 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 pipes to, to do this dragon and during uh, creating this dragon during making it uh, they have we have spoken the message and we have uh, 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 and we have you know, we have created it we have spoken the message and then on the stage and there were some subtitles in, in Polish as well so uh, it was very uh, it was very important and it was the play was so good. It was an amateur play, but the people said that it's so professional. The University of Warsaw have helped us to organize it, that it was made in the uh, Polish uh, th theater in Warsaw. Uh, so it was presented on a big stage. It was very important. And then we have organized two another uh, plays. So one of them was uh, Ufier Welt. So it was this poem of this Vilamovian who has written about the hell and the heaven. And uh, then uh, there was this um, play uh, about uh, that it was very hard play about the history of Vilamovice, about the persecutions after the Second World War. But we, we were very successful in it and it has, uh, has been presented in Warsaw as well. So we are happy that it uh, was. There are some uh, internet sites in, about the message. They are mostly in Polish, but they are in English as well. So this uh, website, what you see here, it's from the uh, University of Adam Mickiewicz in Poznań. It's a big university in Poland, but most of them are from the, but there you can see some transcriptions of the message language. And there are some projects like, for example, the documenting linguistic and cultural heritage of Vilamowice. 
uh, this is a project from uh, from uh, Warsaw University, and uh, uh, there is very important that the transcriptions of the Mesoasian language and the recordings are made uh, by the uh, students of the Mesoasian language, so they can uh, transcribe the uh, language. So it's good for the scholars because for linguists because they have some material to make research on it, and for the people uh, for the Vienna students it's good because firstly they see that they uh, they learn the message through it, and secondly, they get some money for it. So for them, is uh, they spend more time on these languages, on, on, the, on the language. Um, and there were some projects uh, to make some tourists in Vilamovice because uh, uh, there, there, about Vilamovice, you can hear many things in media, in television, but if you come to Vilamovice as tourists, it's always like we have, uh, um, there, are, there is no museum. There is not so. There are not so many things about the language. And thanks to this project, uh, there are some boards in the Mesoasian in every monuments, in every uh, important in, in every important places. You can uh, you can read in the Mesoasian in Polish and in English about it. There are some gadgets that you can buy, some souvenirs. Uh, yeah. And um, so, what's important uh, in the revitalization of Bielamowice? Uh, uh, that we have um, achieved this academic and non academic partnership. Um, it's very important that because uh, the many linguists are, you know, some linguists are very, I have to say, it, so are very strange. They, they say the language revitalization is not good because something, but many linguists would help you, would be interested, would contact you with some and other uh, interesting people. So it's very important. Uh, the language instruction in uh, local school uh, is, uh, we try to give more and more of it, and I think it will, we will be successful. Um, there are some new, new speakers, and there are some teaching materials published. We, create more and more uh, materials, so I think we will be successful in it as well. Mm. A change of this uh, negative uh, ideologies of negative attitudes, we try to do it, and I hope, uh, yeah, I um, think it's very important that people think about uh, the message language, that it's worth of be protected, of be uh, developed and to be revitalized. Um, it would be important to make it officially recognized um, and to make the message a free marker of, of strong local identity. But I think that we are successful with it, that it's very, uh, it gets uh, better. And uh, I think that uh, it's important to uh, settle the objectives of language le learning, teaching, and revitalization at rational uh, scale that you. For example, that you don't teach 200 children the message because if uh, there is no time for other things, uh, I think it would many children would want to uh, study the message, but unfortunately, because of the lack of the teachers, we cannot do it in that big scale. And if if we would do it in too big scale, it would not be good for other parts of our uh, of our. Uh, activities and to make the message visible and stable element of local language landscape is very important uh, for every language is that it's they are visible in the local community that they are that you can hear it but you can see it as uh, as uh, well yeah it would be good to make the message commonly understood in the town but because sometimes you speak the message and somebody says, I cannot understand it, speak Polish, but if everybody would maybe understand the language, that would be, uh, that would be, uh, uh, that would be uh, good. And uh, to promote multilingualism in the, in the community, because uh, the, uh, many people think that uh, this, that you speak in one language uh, is uh, the standard, but you know, uh, you have to show to the people that uh, it's not common that you speak in one language. It's a normal situation that you speak in many language if you, languages if you live on the border of some regions or in the, some regions that uh, there are spoken more languages. So to show that multilingual is not only of minority languages, but as well another, for another languages, it's very important to teach it in the school that uh, uh, that uh, 
that you know uh, if you learn many languages this is the positive thing uh, and uh, yeah if you learn many languages you can learn as well minority language uh, to make some space for uh, your language because many times it's like as i said if you speak your minority language somebody says i cannot understand it but then if you make for example a room in the school or in some center in the house but in this room you speak the message people come to speak the message every week or something like this you can put some uh, texts in your language some words on the walls or something like this that would be very good place to do and we tried we have made uh, it but i think it's important as well that you cannot forget that i think it's not a good idea that you as i don't know uh, activists that you as uh, uh, teachers do it and you invite the students it's more it would be better if you do it with the students because they feel that they can take part in this uh, in this activity you have to deal with the issue of historical trauma of uh, languages for example in Bilamovice we have to remember about these persecutions and we have to uh, speak about this but I think uh, uh, that it's very important that uh, if you don't speak about the trauma, uh, it will not uh, pass away, it will come back. So it's, it's better to speak and to work on it. Um, and to, uh, yeah, we uh, teach the message at courses uh, offered by uh, the University of Warsaw as well. Then it's very um, interesting for people in Bilamovice that some students from Warsaw come to Bilamovice and they can speak the message. So for them it's very interesting that people not from Bilamovice can speak the message. Uh, and to make uh, uh, the in the internet languages visible in Polish mass media. Yeah. So uh, as I always say, it's not only because if you say only your language is important, it's not the way you you, you have to show that the multilingualism and that the uh, revitalizing and the end of languages uh, that this everything is uh, uh, is important and that uh, yeah and that uh, then you will be successful and the cooperation with other communities with other groups uh, is very important so I uh, what I wanted to say on the end of my presentation that uh, this professor Tomasz Wiherkiewicz, who has written that in 10 years so in 2010 the message language will be dead I have sent to him an email in 2010 and I have written to him and you know you have written it and there is 2010 and we speak the message and then he has uh, written to me that uh, he is very happy about his mistake and he would wish him that uh, he would make uh, more uh, such mistakes that are so positive <laughs> and he came to Vilamovice in the same year and he started to help us with uh, our with our uh, revitalization and now he's our friend and i think so this is a uh, example of uh, this positive uh, cooperation of local uh, community and uh, and uh, scholars and universities and uh, it's important that people from local communities become uh, some grades and the universities because uh, you know uh, many times some linguists uh, Try to make field work and don't take care of the uh, of the community. And then, if in this community are another linguist or another ethnologues or another historians or other uh, people with uh, some academic grades, but from the community they can protect the community. Uh, but the, you know the linguists, the uh, scholars from outside, they are thinking, yeah, there are some other scholars. We have to deal with them as well. So I think. I have uh, made some uh, summary of our revitalization uh, activities and I hope that you have uh, learned something from me and I uh, like it very much that you have invited me to tell you something about us because as I said I'm very happy that I can share our uh, uh, history of revitalization with other uh, uh, people with other groups and I hope maybe you can come to Vilamovice one time uh, if you are in uh, uh, in Poland or in uh, uh, not far from Bielorussia, you can come to Bielorussia and visit us. We will be happy. So uh, on the uh, so this presentation was made uh, by me and by my friends from University of Warsaw. 
uh, who work with me. The first email, the venezoil.gmail.com is the contact to me. So if somebody would like to um, would like to contact me, ask me more questions, because now you can uh, ask me questions as well. If you would like to contact me later, then there is a contact to me, so you can you can uh, contact me. Uh, yeah, there is a question that uh, experience of what language do you find most similar with yours? Mm, you know, um, it's very hard to say because uh, the message is a very specific language. It's a language used only in one town in a very small area. For example, there is a language uh, who had a similar uh, history, the Silesian language in Poland, but um, uh, for, so for example, this uh, persecutions after the Second World War and this uh, thing, uh, this uh, you know, uh, association with Germans or something like this. But it's another situation because a very it's a very big language. It's a language that is spoken by uh, about two hundred thousand people. So for us, it's a very big language. But I think. Um, uh, yeah, I cannot say that uh, every language has, uh, each language has its own history. And I always want to say that uh, mm, you don't have to be ashamed of this history. Uh, and uh, there are some linguists who say uh, you shouldn't use these words, you should uh, use the more archaic words. But uh, for example, in Gramovice, yeah, it's part of our history that the language was not used uh, a long time and that we came back to. Uh, using this language so that we have uh, this uh, and that we have some new words, some Polish words is very important. Uh, but uh, there is, uh, yeah, for example, there is uh, mm, this uh, Kashubian language in Poland that uh, uh, has been recognized by the uh, Polish uh, country, by Polish government. And uh, now they have more support from the, uh, so this, the situation is in another way, but there are some similarities as well. So I cannot uh, answer the question so direct. I could say I don't know any, any uh, very similar situation to mine. But the Silesian one is uh, similar maybe because it's uh, very near, it's, uh, yeah. 10 kilometers from Vilamovica is the border, uh, the border with Silesia. So I got a question, but it's in, um, I don't know if it's a question from to me because it's in Russian and I cannot read Russian. So if you can write it to me in another language that I can understand, it would be good. So how many speak? Uh, so how many speakers of the message there are? Uh, so it's uh, as well it's hard to say because there are about 25 uh, uh, old speakers uh, who uh, who speak the uh, message and uh, if uh, uh, and these people are the native speakers but then uh, there is a group of people who used to speak the message as a native language then they stopped to use it because of the ban. They then they uh, spoke Polish, but Polish is not the native language for them because it's a second language, and they have forgotten to speak the message. But now we try to uh, teach them the message, and some of them learn. So I don't know if they are the second language learners because on one side they were native Vietnamese speakers, and the other uh, hand side they have forgotten the language and started to teach to learn it after years. But um, if uh, we speak about new speakers, about the second language learners, um, there are about uh, 
So uh, there are now about, I think, 40 people who learn the message, but uh, I would say that there are about 15 people who can speak fluent the message, the, uh, the young people who can speak fluent the message. They are mostly Vietnamovians, there are some of them are from abroad, some linguists who are interested in, in the language. Uh, oh, with Manx language, yeah. Uh, so we have visited the Manx uh, island, uh, the, the Isle of Man, yeah. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, there are some similarities. Um, but, um, you know, the Manx language uh, was a language that was revitalized. Uh, how to say it? It was completely uh, dead and extinct, and there, then they started to revitalize it. Uh, and we, uh, what we try to do is to connect the new speakers with the old speakers, that uh, the language that they speak is connected with the language of the elder people. Yeah, it will not be the same language because the language has to develop. It's natural that the language changes, but uh, we try to connect them. And yeah, the um, experience of the Manx language is very interesting and for us it was very positive that somebody can um, that somebody can build the language in a new way and uh, I think uh, yeah that uh, our visit there have uh, helped uh, us uh, to see the future of our language that we can do some projects like they do uh, yeah that for them it's not so important to speak the language all the time that, uh, but it's more important that you meet, for example, one time uh, for three days in a group that you can speak the language there and that you can, uh, that you can yeah, take care of your, of your language identity, of your identity. Um, so uh, the question of if I have the on, uh, if we have the online courses, unfortunately not. But now we uh, try to um, create. Uh, we have created some book with uh, with some words and some sentences, and uh, there are recordings of it. So if you will be interested, uh, I think in two months it will be printed and there will be an online version of it as well so I can send you a link if you write them and uh, if you can see how does it look like it, it will be and about the teams you know uh, there are many themes of uh, in Vilamovice that are interesting because I, for example I investigate the, as well uh, the um, the persecutions after the second world war so the uh, memory, the post memory about the persecutions and how uh, did it influence the language, how did it influence the uh, identity. And I influence, uh, I investigate as well the, um, um, the history of, uh, how to say, the role of the scholars in minorities. So how did, uh, how did the scholarship, how did the professors and the uh, universities, in, universities influence the uh, minorities, uh, mostly our minority, Vietnamian, but not only, uh, as well the Silesian minority uh, during the most, you no, know, no, uh, during the Second World War and before the Second World War, because it was from the German side very big uh, movement of um, uh, of uh, of German. Uh, Professors, yeah, but um, most of the themes are about the <laughs> as I said. So uh, this is the here is the question about the project. Uh, um, this is a project, the Horizon 2020. That was a project of uh, uh, of um, developing 
um, some personal network of uh, universities and local communities. So it, there were some conferences organized by this uh, in this project. Uh, it was uh, the conferences were in Vilamovice, in Mexico, in uh, England, in Poland, in uh, uh, Netherlands, uh, on the Isle of Man, uh, for example, and it was like to connect people from universities and from local uh, uh, communities uh, that they can work together on uh, on some, uh, yeah, that they can work together in the future on some projects. So it was the, it was uh, financed by the European uh, by the European uh, Union, and it was uh, organized by uh, it was organized uh, uh, by uh, um, University of Warsaw, the Faculty of Artes Liberales. If you write this Engage Humanities in Europe and you write uh, Vilamovice in the Google or in another uh, browser, then you can find the uh, you can find the uh, uh, how to say it, um, you can find uh, the website of this uh, project. Mm, yeah, and this is about the question about the topics of my investigation. So as I said, there are, uh, there are many topics in, in Vidamovice that we indicate, and there are topics uh, uh, in another, um, in another, uh, uh, minorities that we investigate, but my uh, I focus on um, the language ideologies. I focus on the trauma of post-war perceptions, and I focus on the um, folk dress as well. And uh, yeah, because I'm uh, I my identity is like a social linguist and ethnologue, so anthropologist. So uh, I'm not focused only on the language and focus on the whole community. So as well, the folk dress as local identity, that's um, uh, the uh, topics of my uh, research, of my uh, investigation. Uh, so there's a question about uh, Poland's minority languages which are healthier. I would not say that they are healthier. It was, you know, because uh, sometimes uh, there are uh, uh, there, there are uh, small languages uh, that will survive, <laughs> and there are big languages that that will uh, be dead, unfortunately. Because it's not uh, the most important is not how many people speak this language, but uh, the most important are the ideologies about this language, and the most important are who speaks the language. So if we have one million of people who are 80 years old and they don't teach another people, so this language will not survive. But if you have a small language that uh, is taught in the school, for example, or is, is uh, taught by intergenerational uh, connectings, it's uh, it can uh, be alive. So. In Poland, you have the Silesian language, which is not recognized, and I think uh, there are about 200,000 of speakers, and the language is... Um, some children speak this language, but not so many, but most of people understand it in, the, in Silesia. The Kashubian language is taught in the schools, so it's very important, uh, it's very healthy, I would say. Uh, it's, there are about 100,000 speakers of this language, it's in the uh, north of Poland. The Ruthenian language, I cannot say because they are uh, uh, they aren't in one place. They are in many places in Poland, so uh, I don't know. There are about five thousand speakers, but they don't have their schools because yeah, because there is no village, no town where they live. They live in many places, uh, so they cannot do it. Um, they and there is um, the Karaim language that is. Uh, there are two speakers of it in Poland, but they have the right to have schools but they are too few to have schools so as i said the german minority in poland they have their schools and they have their uh, organizations and they are supported by polish countries so it's uh, 
So it's uh, so I would say the Silesian language is bigger and it's more healthy. And in the Kashubian, the best situation is in the Kashubian language. But the other languages are not so good. And if you ask about uh, the next question is about the general Polish language policy regarding traditional minority languages. As I said, uh, the languages which are recognized uh, have some support from the country. And the languages which are not recognized, they don't have support, and even they are not good, they are not seen as languages. They, are, they, are, they aren't banned, but in the school you cannot use it. And for example, if you would use it on the lesson, you can get some bad uh, notes or something like this. So uh, these languages, the Kashubian language, Belarusian, German, Tatarian, uh, Karaim, Ukrainian, Ruthenian, mm. yeah, and uh, Lithuanian. I don't know if Russian language is as a minority language. So that's about 10 languages there are as languages, and the user of these languages can have their media, they can use it in the school, they can have lessons in this language, they can write some exams in this language. So that uh, languages are supported by Polish country, but the minorities like Silesians or Vilamovians or other minorities uh, who are not recognized, uh, there is no, no support. Uh, what can minorities do when dominate some hostile language ideology? So, you know, there are many ways to change the uh, ide uh, uh, local ideologies. Uh, I think that uh, to show your language in media, to make this theatrical place, to um, show it that it can be used in uh, internet, or that young people use it, or that it's something important to show other people, uh, it's mostly to be present. Yeah, if the language is present, if you can make it present uh, in the community, it's it helps. And for example, if there are some professors, some people, some tourists, who, somebody who comes from outside because of the language and asks about the language, that helps a lot. I have seen it in Vilamovice so that I thought that the most important is to make some from our, something from our side. It's important as well, but when other people come and, uh, some, uh, and so when other people are interested in the language, the local community tries to change the uh, tries to change the, uh, their mind, yeah? They can start to think, because you'll see this guy from a uh, local cultural center that uh, told eight years ago that, that there is no uh, future for Vilamian language and he will not uh, help us. Now he helps us and he has seen that, you know, when young people are engaged in it, it's something worth to do. And I think it's important that you can that uh, you convince you can convince people by showing that it's important for other people as well because many times if you are from the local community the other people will not believe you yeah but if you have some people from uh, uh, from outside uh, yeah that it that helps yeah But if you, uh, yeah, if um, there are many texts about uh, language ideologies now, and if you would uh, want to know more about it or discuss more with me about it, you can write uh, to me uh, an email. And it is a question how it may change. Yeah, so, for example, uh, yeah, in Vidamovice, it was like when we started to, when we said that there will be lessons of the Messierish, many. The parents said, no, we will not send our children to these lessons because, uh, I don't know, the language is not worth of it. How will they teach it? Uh, it's not a good language or something like this. Uh, uh, and um, then uh, they start, then as some children started to come to our lessons, uh, they have convinced their friends that they come, then the children have convinced parents because the parents have seen, you know, the children learn it. It's it's uh, interesting. They like it, so it's something worth of support. And then that change in this way. You know, if they see a theatrical play in the language, they think we thought that it's only a language of farmers, and now we see that it can be in the theater. It's very interesting. Yeah. So uh, sometimes you don't think that it will change, but it will change. 
And now it is a, a question of how do we found our product. It's uh, that belongs because sometimes sometimes we have some fundings from the university, but it's mostly like uh, I don't know for organizing. Yeah, for organizing the conference, for example, the university have organized the conference. But uh, sometimes we have some money from the university. They have it from the European Union from some products. Um, for uh, printing some materials, but you know, uh, it's uh, not so big part of our activities. Most of our activities we make without money. So it's like if you want to teach the language, you, uh, for example, I uh, teach the language eight years, and I don't, I don't have money from it. Yeah, it's like uh, it's my, uh, it's it's what I want to do, and it's what what I do. Sometimes uh, I have I don't know when I do some course for university. Sometimes I get some money for, uh, from them. But for example, if we organize this uh, place, yeah, this uh, theatrical place, so only what you need are people and the text, and then the clothes or something. We made it from our own. Uh, you, we don't buy it. We, you know, we buy some old clothes uh, or make take some old clothes from our houses, and uh, we sew the clothes. And to, to make this dragon, we used, as I said, toilet paper and some pipes. And uh, so we didn't have uh, uh, much uh, funding. The most important is uh, I don't know how is your situation, but in our situation, the most important is if you organize it and we do it and. Sometimes you have some money, sometimes not. But uh, if you, you like it, you will do it without money. So, as I say, we are we are activists. We are uh, from local community. We it's good if if we would have money for it, but it's uh, not the most important. So I always say the problem of Silesian language is that they don't have any fundings, and and I always say to them, uh, you you should try to. Uh, start your uh, revitalization without fundings, and then maybe you can find find some. You don't you don't know, but the situation is different in other countries, in other regions. So, in our case, it's uh, as I said, so we don't count on fundings. We are more like uh, self. Uh, yeah, we, we do our from ourselves everything. Yeah, but if you are more interested in the projects that we have done, as I say, you can write to me an email. I can send you some links. Uh, and if you write this uh, Engage Humanities in Europe, there are some links as well to another projects that we have done. Um, so maybe you can uh, maybe you can find something interesting for you. Uh, yeah, we have uh, we have one textbook for small children. Now, as I said, we are preparing the, another textbook for I would say for adults. There are more sentences and uh, uh, translations in Polish, uh, and uh, I have uh, written as well many uh, materials for my students that I have written. You know. And to have painted it in our houses, so uh, we have some, and it's in online as well. So if you are interested, the most of them are on the uh, are on the websites. I think I can. Uh, uh, I think on this website, I hope it works. Uh, there are some uh, materials and some uh, books for children, some textbooks. That you can uh, that you can see, and there was a um, literature in the Messiah language before the Second World War as well, and and then of the 19th century. The problem was that they used another autography than us. But we have transliterated uh, some of uh, the old texts in new way, so they are available as well uh, in the website. Uh, uh, yeah, on this website. I think it's it is in English as well. Oh, it was.
Yeah, this is the correct address. Baltic language. I haven't heard about it, so I will uh, write it for me and then I will. Maybe I can investigate now. So somebody is asking about the website. Maybe I have made a mistake. Uh, I think this would be correct. And uh, what should be recommended to the Votic community to preserve their language? So as I understand, there are uh, some old people who speak this language. Um, and um, there are some dictionaries and other language material, but there's uh, mm. there is no. But what means that there is uh, no opportunity uh, of uh, ending some language nest with them? So they don't don't want to do it, or I don't know. There is some another problem of it, um, because. Uh, um, in uh, Vinamovice, uh, in the year 2000, uh, yeah, but in the in as I started uh, to uh, to be interested in the in the Messerish, uh, 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 language, uh, yeah, I was a child and I was uh, I went to the older people who speak the language, so. I think the case that they are old and another people are young. It's not. It's the the thing that you have to do is to, is to convince young people that and and old people they that they can contact together. And for example, in Vilamovice, it uh, uh, with a time it got like the uh, Messerich is uh, now a secret language for grandparents and grandchildren because. Uh, they can speak the message and the parents, so the middle generation cannot understand it. So it's something like what um, makes something what they have common. Yeah, and I think um, that, but they have to. They had to be. They had to be activists who would organize something with the children and with the elder people. But because sometimes it's harder to teach from own uh, grandmother or grandfather than from another people. Maybe if. Uh, as I said, in Vilamovice we had the same situation. We, uh, as children, as teenagers, we have found the common language with the older people. So I think the you can you, you can try it. Yeah, but uh, there have to be somebody who starts it. Yeah, like in our case, that was me. That I went to the old people. I started to. Um, record them. I start to tell them. Maybe you teach us something. Yeah? I think that uh, there are. There would be. Uh, you would find some people who would be interested. <laughs> How do I motivate myself when I'm tired? Yeah. You know, sometimes uh, there are some moments that uh, you think that I think, uh, yeah, I'm tired, I don't want anymore. But then uh, I speak with some old people who say to me, you know, 
there was 60 years that I couldn't speak the message. And now, thanks to you, uh, the young people speak the message, I can speak my language. Uh, and I think that such moments are very motivating. And for example, I can remember that one Vietnamese woman has invited me for her, uh, it was uh, the, her birthday, but it was the nine, 95th birthday. And actually, I asked her, yeah, I will come to your birthday party, but uh, yeah, I, I'm not her. Relate, I'm not related to her. I only have recorded her to speak the message. And I asked, but why do you, uh, why do you, um, why have you invited me actually? And she said, you know, because I want that on my uh, birthday there is somebody with whom I can speak the message. Yeah? So that, or what, uh, that are uh, such motivating moments. Yeah. Or, uh, yeah. And for me, it's very. For me, there is. Um, uh, there is a big motivation that I can think, thanks to it, what I have done, I can speak in my language now. If I hadn't done it, I would have to speak in foreign language now, for example, for me, yeah? or a language that is not uh, part of my identity. Because you don't to have uh, to be a very fluent speaker to make a revitalization. Yeah? So I was a fluent speaker all the time. But Many people, uh, for many people, it's important that they use their language, even if they don't do it uh, very correct. But the, being correct, it's uh, a question as well, because many times uh, you cannot say what's more correct. Yeah, It's only the linguist stuff. <laughs> uh, many times uh, it's not so necessary. So yeah, there are some moments that I'm tired, but I always think that that's good what I do, not only me, because there are other people, there are uh, young people who are interested in it, and yeah, that's, that's what I think. Yeah, so I uh, thank you too that you have uh, you are interested in what, what I have uh, said, and as I say, uh, you have my email address, so you can contact me, you can write me an email uh, if you are interested in some stuff, I can send you some materials, maybe some uh, texts if you are interested in some uh, stuff um, in English, or maybe you can understand, I don't know if you can understand Polish, maybe yes, so I can send you Polish as well or other so there are or i can uh, contact you with other people who take care of other uh, language uh, languages uh, so if uh, yeah so <laughs> that's good that you understand very so if, if you want you can contact me and we can stay in touch maybe you can come to vidamovic so i will one time come to you so <laughs> maybe you can uh, yeah. so Thank you. Dziękuję bardzo. Yeah, <laughs> that's in Polish. Very good. And the uh, message I can write to you. Good uh, bit uh, Swedish. Uh, that's thank you very much. And uh, and uh, yeah. And I hope you will do the the uh, the revitalization of your languages will be successful. So I. Hope for you, for your languages, and for the Vodic language and everything. Yeah.